Sayın Rektör, Sayın Dekan, Fakültemizin ve Üniversitemizin değerli üyeleri, saygıdeğer izleyiciler, webinarımıza hoş geldiniz. Bugün sizlere 9 Eylül Araştırma Üniversitemizin Uluslararası Konuşmacılar dizisinden birini sunmaktan mutluluk duyuyoruz. Bu toplantının düzenlenmesinde katkıları bulunan rektörlüğümüze, dekanlığımıza, Profesör Doktor Oktay Ergene'ye ve ekibine çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Şimdi sizlere Sayın Rektörümüz Profesör Doktor Nüket Potar hitap ederek konunun önemini vurgulayacaklar. Buyurun efendim. Saygıdeğer mensuplarımız, kıymetli dinleyiciler. Rektörlüğümüz öncülüğünde tıp fakültemiz tarafından düzenlenen ve Berlin Tabipler Odası Birliği'nden Doktor Matthias Broxett'in konuşmacı olduğu Aile İçi Şiddet ve Aile Fertleri Üzerindeki Sonuçları başlıklı programa hoş geldiniz. Öncelikle güzel kentimizden sizlere seslenmekten mutluluk duyuyorum. Bugünkü etkinliğimize katılan ve değerli fikirlerini paylaşacak olan Bay Broxet'e toplantının moderatörü öğretim üyemiz Profesör Doktor Serpil Baysal'a ve dinleyicilerimize teşekkür ediyorum. Değerli katılımcılar, şiddet sadece eğitim, kültür ya da coğrafya ile sınırlandırılacak bir olgu değildir. Şiddet, insanın varlığını ve haklarını hedef alan, birey ve toplum hayatını derinden etkileyen olumsuzluklar zinciridir. İnsan ilişkilerindeki sevgiyi, saygıyı ve hoşgörüyü ortadan kaldıran bu kavram, aileyi bir arada tutan bağları da zedelemektedir. Bu durum, toplumun gelişmişlik düzeyine, sosyal ve ekonomik yönden zarar vermekte, kimi zaman da insanlarda geri dönülmez yaralar açmaktadır. Geleneksel aile yapısının ön plana çıktığı, ya da sosyoekonomik düzeyi yüksek ülkelerde de şiddet kavramı baskıya, zorbalığa ve radikal davranışlara neden olmaktadır. Özellikle kadınların, çocukların ve özel gereksinimi olan bireylerin muhatap kaldığı bu tablo, ülkelerin kalkınma ve refah odaklı politikalarına da zarar vermektedir. Kıymetli dinleyenler, ülkemizde son yıllarda aile içi şiddetin önlenmesine yönelik ciddi adımlar atıldığına şahit oluyoruz. Kadın, çocuk ve özel gereksinimi olan bireylerin hak ve menfaatlerinin korunmasına yönelik bu çalışmalar sosyal devlet anlayışına uygun olarak sürdürülüyor. Yaşanan olumsuzluklara rağmen kadın sığınma evlerinden sevgi yuvalarına, sağlık ve danışmanlık hizmetlerinden güvenlik uygulamalarına kadar Birçok hizmet devletimiz tarafından veriliyor. Bunun yanı sıra ilgili mevzuatta düzenlemeler yapılarak konunun hukuki boyutu da ihmal edilmiyor. Bakınız daha birkaç gün önce kadına ve sağlık çalışanlarına yönelik şiddetin önlenmesini içeren kanun teklifi Türkiye Büyük Millet Meclisi'nde kabul edildi. Bu önemliydi. Çünkü kadına ve sağlık çalışanlarına yönelik kasten işlenen eylemler katalog suçuna alınmış oldu. Dolayısıyla üniversite olarak bu yeni düzenlemenin kadınlarımızın korunmasına yönelik mücadelede önemli bir kazanım olduğunu düşünüyoruz. Değerli katılımcılar, ülkemizin şiddetin önlenmesine yönelik kararlılığı, sosyal politikalarımız ve ulusal hedeflerimiz açısından da kilit rolü oluşturuyor. Sonuçta, Aile içi şiddetin engellenmesinin sadece mevzuata yapılacak düzenlemelere bağlı kalamayacağını hepimiz biliyoruz. Burada eğitim faaliyetleri başta olmak üzere farkındalık oluşturacak çalışmaların yürütülmesi ve sosyal dayanışma mekanizmalarının geliştirilmesi ön plana çıkıyor. Özellikle de aile içi şiddetin önlenmesinde sadece kamu kurumları sorumluluk taşımıyor adli ve idari tedbirlerin yanı sıra küresel olarak da bu sorunu çözmek, işbirliklerini de zorunlu kılıyor. Bu noktada bilim dünyasının, sivil toplum kuruluşlarının 
fikir önderlerinin ve karar vericilerin kapsamlı işbirliği sergilemesi gerekiyor. Biz bu noktada inisiyatif almaya özen gösteriyoruz. Saygıdeğer dinleyiciler, üniversite olarak şiddetin engellenmesine yönelik gayretlere ve faaliyetlere önem veriyoruz. Özellikle de ailenin yapı taşı olan kadınlara yönelik akademik çalışmalar yürütüyoruz. Geçtiğimiz aylarda düzenlediğimiz 8 Mart Dünya Kadınlar Günü panelinde bu yaklaşımımıza uygun olarak kadınların hayatın her alanında daha fazla yer alması gerektiğini söyledik. Buradaki bilimsel paylaşımların toplumun her kesimeye ulaşmasını da hedefledik. Sonuçta kadının sosyal ve iktisadi hayattaki varlığı şiddetin önlenmesinde bir aşamaya işaret ediyor. Çünkü ekonomik ve sosyal anlamda güçlü ve eğitimli kadınlar daha sağlıklı düşünen bireyler yetiştirebiliyor. Zaten mücadelenin en önemli kısmı da küçük yaşta başlayan aile içi eğitime dayanıyor. Kıymetli dinleyenler, ister fiziki, ister psikolojik olsun, şiddetin her türlüsü birey ve toplum hayatına zarar veriyor. Bunlara işaret eden eylem ve sözlerin de kesinlikle kabul edilmemesi gerekiyor. Üniversitemiz, kadın hakları ve sorunları uygulama ve araştırma merkezimiz aracılığıyla yürüttüğü bilimsel çalışmaları, ilgili kişi ve kurumlarla her ortamda paylaşıyor, kurum içi ve dışı bilgilendirme faaliyetlerini yapıyor. Bu faaliyetler sayesinde yaşam hakkına, ailenin önemine ve şiddetin engellenmesine yönelik farkındalık oluşturuyor. Böylece toplumsal sorumluluklarımızı da yerine getirmeye özen gösteriyoruz. Önümüzdeki dönemde, aile içi şiddetin önlenmesine yönelik fikirlerimizi her platformda vurgulamaya devam edeceğiz. Bu düşüncelerle toplantıya katılan Bay Broxet'e moderatörlüğümüzü yapan öğretim üyesi Profesör Doktor Serpil Baysal'a ve sizlere teşekkür ediyorum. Şiddetin olmadığı ve normalleştirilmediği bir dünya diliyor. Hepinizi sevgiyle selamlıyorum. Sayın Rektörümüze açılış konuşmasını yaptığı ve toplantımıza değerli katkılarda bulunduğu için çok teşekkür ediyoruz. We would like to thank very much to our rector for her opening speech and her valuable contribution to our webinar. Uh, may I have slides please, Hakan Bey? He is the chairman of Continued Medical Education Board of the Berlin Chamber of Physicians, Astekamer Berlin, Germany. Uh, he is going to address domestic violence and sexual assault and their consequences on all family members, especially children and adolescents. Before his presentation, I should give an abridged CV of him. Dr. Brockstedt studied medicine and Latin American studies at the Berlin Uni Free University, Free, Uni Free Universidad Berlin. And then he had an internship in inter internal intensive care at Spandau City Hospital. He was awarded magna cum laude, great success, for his medical thesis on newborn metabolism. Next slide, please. He had a medical internship at Free University of Berlin Children's Hospital for research and patient care for inborn errors of metabolism in 1984. During my three months stay there, we met and I followed this work, his work. A year after, he had visited Jarapasha Faculty of Medicine For three months, we had an agreement between our universities that time. He was a lecturer in neonatology at Amsterdam Free University Children's Hospital, the Netherlands. Next slide, please. Dr. Matthias was the medical director of the Berlin Poison Center for a long time and a lecturer at the Humboldt University Charité 
Charité Hospital. Next slide, please. For 14 years, he acted as medical director of Children and Adolescents Center Berlin Mitte in May. Uh, Mitte in May uh, 2012, he invited me for a conference on Ken, both at the chamber and a school for Turkish people. Since 2015, he was honored by the German Association of Pediatricians for his cont contribution to preventive medicine. Since 2012, uh, 20, uh, 2011, he is a senior consultant for the Association for Drugs and Drug Abuse. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, this slide shows our meeting at Berlin Chamber of Physicians on May 2012. Next slide, please. National Mother Baby Language Learning Pro Project, Berlin Mitte. Next slide. Since, um, 2019, he is a medical advisor for regional Berlin Health Authorities on behalf of the Chamber for the improvement of medical care in cases suffering domestic violence and so on, following WHO recommendations, uh, Istanbul Convention. Dr. Brockstedt has a good knowledge of English, Dutch, Spanish, and French. He is also, a, he was also a trainer in, uh, of Aikido, but now he is a trainer of dance, dancing group. Now, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Matthias Brockstedt uh, to give his speech. Please, Matthias, we Thank are listening to you. you for 30 to 35 minutes. Yes, of course. You Thank you, Sam. Sam for introducing me and uh, pointing out so many details of my professional life. Uh, first, I have to thank Professor Ota for introducing his webinar and supporting you in the field of uh, social pediatrics. I feel very much honored to talk about what I have learned and experienced during the last 15 years of my uh, work as the Director of Child and Adolescence Community Health in Berlin Center, where I had to take care of about 56,000 children of all ages out of 135 nations. And uh, I have been advisor on child abuse and neglect in general, but uh, the specific subject of today is uh, what you have pointed out, domestic violence and sexual assault and its consequences on all family members, especially on children and adolescents. Uh, what am I actually talking about? Not about uh, child abuse and neglect in general, but I'm talking about a special aspect of endangered child health and well-being in the context of experiencing and being opposed to intimate partner violence between adults and caregivers. What does this term mean? Intimate partner violence comprises all types of aggressive and damaging behaviors between adult person and has uh, catastrophic effects on all family members uh, within the community. It is this form of violence which is most commonly experienced by women globally and it is associated with physical, mental, sexual, and reproductive health problems, and yet death due to suicide or homicide. An estimated, and these are the actual data from 2018, an estimated 27% of all women and girls aged 15. Pardon, you can hear me again. There was a technical uh, break. 
Uh, I start yes. then about uh, intimate partner violence, what children are exposed to. About 27% of all women aged between 15 or older during their lifetime have experienced physical or sexual partner violence uh, and high rates of this type also occur within special groups of uh, gender minorities, people with disabilities, migrants and people from marginalized ethnic or indigenous groups. But 27% of all women uh, means uh, one out of four women during her lifetime will experience this type of uh, aggressive behavior within their partnership. In Berlin, we have had a study done with families from Turkish migration background, and these women suffered twice as much as the uh, women without uh, migratory cultural background from uh, the, any form of uh, domestic violence. And that is what WHO calls uh, this uh, type of aggressive behavior, mostly from men. Uh, it's called domestic violence as a technical term. And it, I will use this term throughout my talk. Uh, and it simply means that the harm is inflicted by a current or former intimate partner living in the same household or having lived in the same household as the victim. This definition includes marital partners as well as life partners of varying time and intensity. What does the list of possible acts of violence comprise? And I think there is something many people and even uh, professionals from pediatrics uh, don't know well and from gynecology as well. Uh, first of all, of course, we mostly think of physical violence, slapping, hitting, kicking, using knives, eating, even choking. This is the typical idea of domestic violence among adults. Then there is the large scope of sexual violence of behavior that occurs without explicit consent, uh, attempted rape, sexual touching, uh, forging a person to perform sexual acts that she won't want, she doesn't want to. But what we are now learning and what in the long term even causes more severe harm uh, is the emotional abuse. These are insults, belittling, humiliation, intimidation, threats to harm, threats to take away the children. And uh, what uh, has been developed over the last years is the controlling behaviors, which are also a form of very aggressive uh, attacks against the uh, normal, uh, well, uh, normal uh, behavior. Uh, what does it mean, controlling behavior? It means to make a person subordinate or dependent, including not giving them the key to leave the house, isolating a person from family or friends, uh, monitoring a person's movements, which nowadays is mostly done by stalkerware or by using smartphones, manipulating smartphones, locks and cameras, as well as respecting a person's access to, to finance, financial resources, to education or even uh, health care, not allowing them to go to a doctor. Uh, this is a continuing uh, act of assault, threats, humiliation and intimidation, and uh, the controlling behavior uh, is something which uh, occurs very early in lifetime. And what intrigues me most is that when I talk with the victims, uh, and there are studies done by WHO worldwide, that uh, uh, of the past years, uh, women of all ages simply accepted that their life partners or husbands had a right to beat them, had a right to constrict their uh, social contacts to their whereabouts, had the right to control them and uh, all their social contacts. Especially young women with little and bad educational background adhered to such absurd cultural models, obsolete cultural models, which simply shows the importance of education uh, as a cornerstone in preventing domestic violence and counteract its effects uh, in the long run. Uh, as to the perpetrators, it's mostly men. There are a few attacks on men as well, but normally it's the women that are attract, uh, attacked by the husbands or friends in the household. And they as well, the perpetrators, 
uh, are really adherent to traditional role models, paternalistic role models, and that in fact guarantees the impunity of men of all ages and the naturalness of their aggressive and controlling behavior against their spouses and uh, female partners. There is a special problem, especially in permissive uh, societies like in Germany with the alcohol consumption, because uh, the role of alcohol is often underestimated as a promoter of loss of control, of very aggressive behavior, and it often goes uh, together with uh, every type of domestic violence. How, as a doctor, do we notice signs and symptoms of domestic violence? Uh, the uh, already mentioned Istanbul Convention from 2011 uh, has given us the support and medical background for a standardized diagnosis, a woman-centered help offer in the communities, taking into account regional uh, differences. It forms, in fact, the base for documentation of all types of physical, sexual, emotional damage inflicted. Uh, since 12 years, we in Berlin uh, Medical Association offer regular training seminars cooperating with uh, forensics and the signal group of social workers who train medical specialties, specialists of all faculties uh, uh, in the clinical diagnosis and in the correct standardized documentation. I put a much emphasis on this documentation. It includes photography, written text, the sketches, uh, because uh, often it takes months or years until a legal process uh, takes place. And then it's very important that you have any form of uh, standardized documentation of what has really happened maybe half a year or a year ago. Uh, to help uh, women in these uh, circumstances, the Berlin uh, Charity Forensic Medicine offers nowadays a 24 seven medical service for the correct legal documentation of all types of domestic and intimate partner violence, open to the general public and free of charge. This exists since eight years and it's going on and it's widely used throughout the city. Uh, we at Berlin Medical Association at the Chamber of Physicians and responsible for medical formation put much emphasis on medical awareness and continuous medical training on the subject because too many cases of domestic violence go undetected. Although the victims have consulted their general practitioner, although they have been uh, at a specialist but did not dare to directly ask for help. And it's up to every specialist nowadays to put uh, it into his or her mind that maybe uh, the symptoms and the signs I, um, I'll be presented could be a hint for any type of domestic violence. Uh, just give me, let me give you three simple examples. For a specialist in ear, nose, and throat, for instance, uh, finding tiny hematomes behind the earlobes on both sides uh, simply is never an accident. It's simply by slapping. There's no other way to cause this type of uh, uh, hematomas on both sides behind the ears. But are you always looking behind the patient's ear? Easier for the ophthalmologist who just sees the black eye of a woman uh, behind the sunglasses. And this is rarely the accident, uh, local accident. Uh, uh, and it's definitely not bleeding disorders, but it's mostly inflicted by a punch. And the general practitioner, uh, while doing his examination, might notice bruises on the inner side of the forearms. This is a typical sign uh, uh, and which never happens in household accidents, but it's just the proof of defensive movements of women against uh, attacks against her head. These are very simple physical signs, but you have to look for it. You have to ask about it. And uh, only about 20% of confirmed cases uh, uh, of these uh, attacks against women are brought to legal consequences. Often it is the victims themselves uh, that retract the initial charge against the perpetrator, may it be uh, forced by him or uh, implicated by promises of uh, change of behavior in the future. This often ends in uh, worse outbreaks of uh, domestic violence soon thereafter, and even in uh, homicides that might have been prevented. 
Nevertheless, we need all these data, we need this documentation. They form the base of our actions to be taken. And of course, they help us to uh, understand whether the measures we take really uh, are effective. And uh, just to give you some very few data, uh, it has been uh, published in February this year in the Lancet, uh, a survey worldwide of about 2 million women aged 15 to 49 years, uh, and they have been surveyed on uh, lifetime experience of violence at home or uh, experienced violence during the last 12 months. And those both ciphers uh, uh, have been shown for 160 countries. Unfortunately, no data existed for Germany, although a German professor from Maximilian University in München took place in this study, which was uh, done by WHO in Geneva by the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and the McGill Master University in Montreal. Uh, all these data show that 27%, as I pointed out, one in four women during her lifetime has experienced any type of intimate partner violence. And 13% of these 2 million women that have been surveyed uh, told uh, the surveyors that they had experienced uh, violence during the last 12 months. So this is the two cycles you have to take in. Uh, uh, mind, 27% all over the lifetime, 13% during the last year. Uh, and if we look into different countries, there are lists, and you can just uh, look it in the, up in the Lancet for 160 countries, uh, uh, you will definitely know and want to know the data from Turkey, the lifetime experience of any form of intimate partner violence lies above the median range. It is 32% and uh, the experience of the last year is within the range uh, of 12%. Uh, generally, the highest prevalence can be found in uh, African sub-Saharan countries. Uh, if you take, for instance, uh, Republic of Congo, uh, you will have a rate of about 47% of women who have experienced violence during her lifetime and 36% just during the last year. This cipher worldwide in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the lowest uh, ciphers we found in the high income countries in Scandinavian countries like Denmark, Sweden or Norway, where the average uh, lifetime experience of violence is about 21% and the experience of the last year, three to four. But uh, you can already know from these data that poverty by itself might increase the rates of uh, any type of domestic violence you suffer as a woman. Uh, other differences between uh, Muslim countries and uh, uh, Hindu countries like India, in fact, there are differences. Uh, Muslim countries like the Islamic Republic of Iran, for instance, or in Pakistan, have high ciphers above the global average of 27%. Uh, it's in the range of 31 and uh, 9%. And the experience of last year's uh, violence is 18 to 16% uh, in these Muslim countries with a wide range of uncertainty. The prevalence is uh, sometimes uh, only given as uh, 16% and in other studies and surveys is up to 50%. This might be due to not really reliable data collection. But as you find out, there is poverty and there are cultural reasons to make sure uh, we have differences. And that is very important because you have to address the problem of domestic violence in your country, in your city, in your community. And therefore, you have to know about the regional possibilities, about the cultural differences. Fortunately, in Berlin City, if compared to Germany, we have had really uh, actual data. And these data uh, from our Institute of Statistics helped us to start uh, a task force, a so-called roundtable in January 2019 on how to improve the health and diagnostic tools for all women that suffer any type of domestic violence and to their offspring as well. Uh, I just give you four data from the Berlin survey of the Institute of Statistics. In 2007, we had 14,600 cases of legally noticed 
domestic violence. And 10% of them, 1,560 were very severe physical damage, 400 were severe cases of sexual assault, and there were 16 homicides. So if you look at these uh, homicides, you will see this is just the tip of the iceberg. And underneath, uh, you have with a factor of 1,000, the severe physical damages, and with a factor of 10,000, you have all types of legally noticed domestic violence. And this is only the 20%. So the rest goes undetected. And that from this uh, ciphers, you simply understand why this is a major problem uh, all over the world. And uh, what does this domestic violence implicate on other household members uh, besides the attacked women? Uh, this is, in fact, uh, underestimated as well for many years. And uh, it has even taken uh, years for us pediatricians to make uh, people aware that children as well undergo severe emotional damage due to just being exposed to domestic violence between the parents. They have not been hit themselves. And it's often blamed by the perpetrators of domestic violence uh, that the children of the household had not been attacked, nor physically abused or damaged, and thus no child abuse had taken place. This is completely wrong. Because child abuse it does not only include direct physical damage or neglect or sexual assault. Uh, the youngest one I treated was three years old. Uh, it also includes all forms of emotional abuse and neglect. And a child just attending and noticing household quarrels and violent attacks against his mother will definitely undergo strong emotional reactions. Uh, that is what I've learned over the past 20 years from our child and adolescent psychiatrists. Uh, emotional abuse and neglect cause permanent changes in the cortisol-mediated uh, stress uh, reactive cerebral system, the so-called hyp hypothalamic uh, adrenal axis, and it might even cause what I call scars in the brain, which you can't see from the outside. Uh, the growing brain of small children uh, shows uh, changes we have scientific evidence uh, of permanent brain damage, as seen by MRT studies, that uh, simply derive from emotional abuse and being exposed to domestic violence, even if not having been touched directly. And this has to be taken into account because even in the long run, uh, we have now learned that mental and emotional consequences of this uh, severe uh, actually uh, happenings during early childhood uh, have a lifelong uh, implication on uh, mental health. It can be seen in adolescents or adults as a major depression in later life, as post-traumatic stress disorders, borderline personality changes, anxiety disorders, lots of sleep and eating disorders like anorexia and binge eating uh, derive from the exposure uh, of smaller children to just uh, this type of domestic violence. Uh, they also have a higher rate of suicides in later life and of substance abuses. Uh, one in four children under the age of five lives uh, with a mother who has a, been a victim of intimate partner violence. So that means we have a, a very high number of children we have to take care of early. And this is something which uh, has intrigued me mostly from what I've learned from Professor Lago in Zurich about uh, the neurodevelopmental uh, scarring and about uh, uh, acting early in the course of a child's lifespan. Because in fact, if you look into it uh, continuously, you can also talk about prenatal damage that is when pregnant women are attacked physically, for instance. But uh, what I have learned from psychiatrists is that you have to intervene very early in life uh, time to uh, prevent these uh, damages in later life, these scars in the brain, and this type of uh, deterioration and sequelae, which definitely take place and can only be uh, treated in early childhood. Uh, it is uh, crucial to prevent mental health problems later on. Uh, therefore, uh, you have to look into early reactive signs or symptoms of emotional abuse 
and neglect as consequences of domestic violence, which is not that easy. Uh, uh, be it in your doctor's uh, office or in hospital during medical examination for any other reason, you always have to take into mind that there might be a discrepancy between what you uh, see and observe as a specialist and what the parents or caregivers are talking to you about, uh, maybe some behavior changes, which might have very uh, logic uh, cause like uh, uh, believe dear family member, grandmother has died. So there will be reactive emotional reactions of any child is normal and this is well explained but there are many discrepancies and uh, you have to look into these date more in detail and carefully ask for more details it might be even of great help for the mothers uh, who have been physically abused at home that you as a doctor a physician a pediatrician for instance uh, uh, focus on the emotional reaction of a child which uh, shows different behaviors from what you are used to and the mother uh, might talk about this at home and you shift the responsibility away from the mother towards yourself because the mother can tell the perpetrator at home, but I did not tell anything to the doctor about your beatings and the bruises. I didn't show them to them, but the pediatrician simply insisted on any type of household quarrels because of Serkan or Aisha behaving differently when what they normally behave and what the doctor, the pediatrician knows. So you help the mother by shifting the responsibility into your field, which of course uh, causes trouble for you as a doctor. But uh, there is no way to solve these problems because they are trouble. Uh, uh, you always have to think about this on an individual level and uh, because it also helps you to understand why not every child that has been exposed to this type of violence will uh, develop uh, problems in their uh, stress reaction system. There is something like personality we know from genetics. There's something like resilience we have learned a lot about during the last decade. There is a lot about good attachment. That is what a child uh, learns during the first eight to 12 months of uh, his life or her life, that uh, she feels safe and has a positive attachment with a sensitive mother who knows how to deal with uh, the demands uh, in the first months of life. Uh, that's why we put so much emphasis nowadays on what we call early help, early help intervention during the first uh, months of life. Uh, to make sure that social stress, uh, poverty, prematurity, chronic diseases, uh, or psychiatric illnesses in the family, even drug abuse like alcohol in Germany, does not uh, uh, cause uh, permanent damage in the children. We in Germany have about two, six million children living in a household where at least one of the family members is drug addicted, mostly alcohol. And uh, on the drug, you lose a lot of uh, control and you have a higher risk of uh, uh, violence in general. At the social level, we nowadays focus much more on cooperation with kindergartens, with schools, with educational institutions, with sports, musical uh, schools, and all types of cultural association. We call this a setting-oriented approach. And this is something new as well for me as a pediatrician trained in uh, university hospitals to talk to teachers, to talk to uh, uh, educators, and to find out that they might have a very different uh, view on a child's development and behavior. And uh, it definitely helps you to install uh, good help. And uh, often it's this social control within kindergartens, within schools, or any type of uh, uh, regional and neighborhood activities that uh, helps you because they have more contact with the children than you during your office hours or in the emergency department where you first of all have to solve acute problems. Uh, what I have learned by this is that we uh, uh, are well advised not to medicalize the problem of domestic violence and the reactive symptoms in children, but to look for possible help also in the other uh, educational and social uh, systems and cooperate with them. Yeah. 
I will give you a personal example uh, from what I've learned uh, doing neurodevelopmental tests with four years old children in kindergartens. We do this on a regular basis, and always there are two children and uh, they are pedagogues and uh, the inner arts, the doctor, uh, the doctor, and the uh, neuro. Uh, so there is the pediatrician that, uh, with two children at a time, uh, does some plays. Uh, it's a playing surround within the kindergarten. So they like to do building block pictures, color. There are some puppets, and you know, as a pediatrician, you use puppets. You're used to this type of uh, uh, instruments, although my medical students always ask me, when do you start to examine the child? Or where is the stethoscope and everything else? And then I'm already examining the child since more than 15 minutes, just by talking to them, playing with them, doing things like uh, uh, yeah, interaction and uh, noticing what uh, the reactions are, whether they are smiling or not. And this was one of my experience with a four-year-old uh, Russian boy. The moment I entered the, the room at kindergarten, the uh, actively running around playing boy stopped like being paralyzed, it just stopped moving, just looked at me with what we as a pediatrician call frozen watchfulness. We know from child abuse and neglect that this is something very typical, but you can observe this as well as a reactive sign uh, if children have been exposed to uh, domestic violence, noticing the male perpetrator hitting the mother. And what I noticed was that this boy just paralyzed his, in his movement. And I asked the pedagogue, what's happening here? And she just told me that this always happens the moment a male person is entering the room. And I asked her, so what did you do? Because this is not a normal behavior. Uh, so what did you do? Did you talk with the mother who brings the child every morning? And uh, did you talk to anybody else from the family? And in fact, it turned out they didn't dare to talk about this. So I helped them with that and uh, told them that this is something very unusual and this is not a normal behavior for a four-year-old healthy boy uh, to uh, paralyze in his movements the moment a male person is in the room. Uh, and then I uh, indulged further into the family history and we asked the family to come around, around in our department and we found out that uh, in the family, in fact, uh, there have been uh, violent attacks uh, since weeks. There have been riotings. The police have been asked by neighbors for several times. Even an uncle living in the family uh, before in the same domestic surrounding had been murdered. And all this without actually anything, anybody taking action. And the woman, the mother, did not dare, of course, to talk about this uh, at kindergarten. And it was to my intervention together with the youth authorities that we uh, installed family help. We did not take the child away because this is something, and I really point out from the experience of our British colleagues uh, in the United Kingdom, that it might, might be completely wrong. You see this problem, an uncle murdered an aggressive father, uh, a boy very timid and, and uh, in a behavioral change, and still you don't take the child into custody immediately, because this is a problem that exists since months or years. And you do install help. And the help is that uh, there will be controls, daily controls. The child will be at kindergarten daily, and you will go uh, to visit the family at home. You install help for the mother. You install help even for the perpetrator. Sometimes there are social controls. You might install legal procedures. But the, the important thing is uh, you never make it an automatism. This is what happened in Great Britain. There, the automatism was that whenever uh, there is uh, exposure to domestic violence, the youth authorities will take the children into custody because of acute danger. This, in fact, endangered even more children because the mothers, uh, with this knowledge, never brought uh, the violence to medical attention. They did not, uh, they stopped calling the police, they stopped calling the doctors, and they don't, didn't go to intensive care or emergency wards because the moment they presented their uh, problems, the children would be taken into custody by youth authorities. 
And that's, uh, in fact, which turned out to be just the wrong way uh, to reduce the number of women who uh, uh, seek help, who look for help. So better not to make it an automatism, but to look into every single case in detail and find out whether there might be a solution. Sometimes it's absolutely necessary to take mother and children into shelter immediately. And therefore, we have 20 shelter homes that also take mothers and children together in Berlin. And this is something you need. Active mother's shelter home is something uh, you have to have in mind. You have to use it. And uh, 20 for a city of 3.6 million uh, uh, seems quite a, a lot, but it's uh, nearly not enough. Uh, for the actual problems that it is. And this is what you have to solve in your local situation to, to find out uh, whether there are this type of protective mother uh, shelters that also accept children, which is not the case in all countries and in all uh, communities. So this is something I have learned, but I've also learned that I never would take a child into custody automatically. If I can find a solution together, of course, uh, in cooperation with the youth health uh, authorities. We never do it on our own. Uh, if you have a doctor or a specialist in every field, may it be um, teachers, may it be doctors, may it be youth health social workers who think they can work on their own, then they are already mistaken. Always cooperation. The moment you start uh, in this field to work on your own, you are not a professional, from my point of view. You're just missing major uh, cooperations and uh, help systems because uh, this is only working on community level and uh, it can never be an automatism. Uh, you know when to take a child into custody. You know when the danger is uh, so high that you take a child into hospital as well to protect it from further aggressive behaviors or uh, direct uh, attacks, uh, you know when to uh, take uh, uh, a child to other family members that might help. The grandparents sometimes are of great value or an aunt or somewhere else. So never make it an automatism. Just find out what the individual case uh, needs. Uh, what has been the conclusion to bring it to a point in, in Berlin uh, out of our task force? Uh, and uh, uh, the 29 organizations that have cooperated over the last two and a half years. We have had, despite the corona pandemic, uh, four general meetings. We had about 20 uh, regional meetings with specialists of, from all fields of pediatrics, gynecology, uh, general pediatrics, from the fire brigades, from psychiatry, from forensics. Uh, from health insurance companies. And this is something I always point out because we are always in this field also talking about financing such as financing is such important. We have first of all made a list of deficits, what's still missing in Berlin in the medical and social care of children and adolescents being exposed to domestic violence. Uh, there's a lot of goodwill of engaged doctors in all fields. And I appreciate it very much because we would not talk about it here if uh, there had not been many doctors like uh, Professor Baishal, for instance, who have engaged in this field and have uh, had, uh, yeah, worked on it uh, for many years and always brought to attention that this is a major problem uh, within pediatrics. Uh, and this is something where the goodwill is very important to start the procedures. But we need structural solutions. We need things, uh, help offers that work. Uh, and uh, we need women shelters that also take care of accompanying children. This must be mandatory in every city, in every community. And we need standardized operating procedures on how to deal with this problem uh, in every specialty. And this is what I call quality control. And for quality control, you need the health insurance companies as well. And uh, what is, has been my task over the last 20 years is a continuous medical training. We have nowadays included in all uh, trainee programs of all subspecialties that deal with patients. May it be ear, northern throat, may it be ophthalmologists, ophthalmologists surgery, may it be uh, pediatricians, psychiatrists, everybody 
has uh, to be trained uh, and has to show in his electronic logbook of five years training at the, uh, the hospital level that they have been trained on cases of domestic violence and its consequences in children. It took me two years to just put this one phrase into our training regulation of Berlin Medical Association. It is now uh, uh, accepted and unanimously uh, put into written documentation and it will be controlled before you can part your examination as a specialist that in your electronic logbook you have been uh, trained and uh, documented in cases of uh, any type of domestic violence against uh, women and the consequences this has for other family members. It took me just two years to put in this phrase and it took, takes me the next five to 10 years uh, uh, to uh, take care of this is really done. We offer train, the trainer seminars and we offer regular trainings uh, every three to five months uh, for subspecialists to learn how to diagnose uh, this type of reactive signs and symptoms in children and adolescents. Uh, for me, a new approach and what we will decide on tomorrow on our fifth meeting of the 29 organization, together with the new Senator of Health in Berlin, with uh, uh, Dr. Goethe, we will decide on whether we can also uh, imply uh, an uh, existing critical incidence reporting system, which is for surgery. Critical incidence uh, reporting system means learning from errors. And this is something which is very underestimated and sometimes it's very difficult uh, to imply because doctors don't like to be criticized. Uh, and talking about errors, often has something to do with, uh, in, in Germany at least, it has something to do with the question whether who has uh, has done wrong, who has, uh, what's the depth, who has made a mistake. If we talk about the mistakes, you won't have an atmosphere to talk about changes. You won't have an atmosphere to admit that maybe uh, you have committed an error because you underestimated the signs and symptoms, or you did not take into account what someone else has told you, or there has not been a good structural supervision in your hospital. There are many things that can be changed. Talking about uh, learning from errors is something I like to introduce. It is well introduced in surgery. Something like critical incidence reporting systems exist in the UK since 20 years or more. And it's the specialists who tell me, if I never receive a report on errors, then I'm really concerned because uh, everywhere where people are working, there will someone commit an error. And it's not only the young ones, there everybody might commit an error. And even to find out whether the error consists in not cooperating with the school, not cooperating with the youth health authority, or just missing an item. These are things where everybody learns from. And therefore, I would like to put emphasis on what the surgeons have learned about critical incidence uh, reporting. And the next two years, maybe we can improve our knowledge. We do this now for the early uh, intervention help. There, we have a system of uh, learning from errors. And I always like to cite the Chinese uh, philosopher, Confucius, who said once, commit an error and not learn from it. That is what I really call to commit. And that's uh, my personal view on the subject. Uh, there will be uh, other things that uh, might help us in the future. Uh, we have uh, installed six uh, child abuse and child protection ambulances at the six large hospitals in Berlin, but their financing still is basic. Uh, and still has to be improved. And this too can only work together with good documentation and with quality control. There is, uh, interestingly, a very economic interest in the, uh, uh, yes, in, in all uh, social uh, circumstances, but also in the health insurance companies. There is economic interest. I told you about the uh, mental health problems that derive out of this early exposure to domestic violence. And these mental health consequences, they cause a lot of medical 
uh, and economical impulse. And for the insurance companies, for society in general, it is of utmost importance to early detect and prevent these sequelae. And this is something I can argue with. And the only thing the uh, insurance company needs are data. And these are the data we can uh, produce from our documentation. Matthias, we have yes, a few I'm finishing. minutes. This is my last phrase. <laughs> I'm just finishing and because uh, I've already pointed out that this continuous documentation is the base for uh, our arguments. If we don't have ciphers, nobody will really listen to us like you have listened to me all the time. And it is now up to you to point uh, questions and to go into more details or to criticize me or talk about your own personal experiences. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank you Hello. very much, Dr. Matthias Brockstedt. Uh, your presentation were, was excellent uh, and uh, you gave much details in this subject. Uh, Dr. Dr. Matthias Brockstedt uh, emphasized uh, reporting system, uh, protection of the women and child, and uh, especially multidisciplinary approach. We also want to thank to Berlin Chamber of Physicians. Now, uh, uh, dear guests, we are waiting uh, for your questions and comments via chat, but uh, the first, uh, first comment uh, came from Jarapasha uh, Faculty of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Haluk Chukurash, your dear friend, uh, sent uh, his greetings to you. And Thank he's you very, very glad to you uh, to see you uh, again after so uh, many years. Uh, after uh, <laughs> very after so many, many uh, years. Uh, yeah. years. Yes. My, my, uh, yeah, I would like to read uh, his comment. Mein lieber alter Freund Matthias, es ist schön nach so vielen Jahren dich wieder zu sehen. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> uh, Dr. Haluk Chokurash. Uh, he is the president now. He is president. He is the president of Turkish Pediatrics Association and also the chairman of uh, Jara, uh, the Department of Pediatrics, Jarapasha Faculty of Medicine, Istanbul University, Jarapasha. Uh, I hope uh, to meet again together uh, in the near future. Um, and the Turkan Büşra Bilgeşen Altun from uh, our medical uh, faculty, uh, three uh, thirty-year student, my uh, my uh, student uh, Bilgeşen Altun. She is very hardworking student. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Brockstedt. Uh, she is uh, nice. telling. And Turkan Gunay from uh, the Department of Public Health, Professor uh, Turkan Gunay uh, sends uh, his thanks. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Brockstedt. And uh, Serkan, uh, thank you, for, uh, Dr. Brockstedt. Thanks for presentation, Ali Köse and Funda Tüzün. Uh, the vice dean from the Tuzun, thanks for your presentation. Uh, those, these are comments. Uh, Turkan Gunay ask a question. What are the root causes of domestic violence? What can be done to prevent? Oh, this is very difficult to answer, as I pointed out, our the cultural differences role models. Uh, I already include nowadays training of perpetrators as a preventive measure. And you have to start in adolescence. You have to train young boys that different behavior models are possible. And you have to give them good examples and alternatives. And this is something which is very difficult to achieve. And that's why I think uh, nowadays we have to cooperate with education systems because we have to start in adolescence and to, to offer different role models, to, to offer uh, models of behavior within families that are different from what uh, the traditional role has been. And this even has to be trained for the women, as I've pointed out in the beginning. 
Thank you. Uh, Ali Köse uh, sent uh, his greetings. Uh, he is a PhD uh, student from Public Health Department. Um, uh, Matthias, I am wondering about the undesirable effects of media and digitalization, digitalization mm -hmm. uh, on uh, family relations and family health. Uh, yes. What are uh, your uh, suggestions yeah. on it? It's in fact it's in a major uh, uh, subject at the moment in all Germany in pediatrics. There is bullying at school among adolescents, but there is also this what I pointed out control uh, uh, madness at home that uh, the smartphones will be controlled, that uh, the access to uh, uh, yeah social contacts will be controlled by technical devices uh, that uh, the whereabouts of uh, women are controlled. Uh, and there is, of course, uh, there are different levels of influence of the digital and social media. Uh, we, at the moment in Germany, try to avoid any screen contact during the first three years of life seems to be a long time, the first thousand days it's called, the first three years of life can be completely without screen presence for uh, growing children. And it helps them, in fact, uh, to develop uh, an analog uh, understanding of the world. And it helps them in their movement and their neurodevelopmental uh, uh, processes because the commissures, the crossing here in the brain it's, it will develop in the first 18 to 36 months. And uh, you need to run around, you need to have practical experience with your hands and body and not to be fixed uh, on a screen. We sometimes, when our social workers at public health uh, uh, visit the families, and we do it for 80% uh, of all families with, and when the child is about three to five months old. Uh, there are many uh, parents who just to soothe and comfort their children, put them in front of the screen. A six month old child uh, in his cradle in front of a, a screen of pictures. Uh, and uh, the mother tells us, uh, well, they are laughing, it's fine. This is a kind for me of child abuse. Uh, uh, during the first three years of life, you should not put your eyes on a screen all the time. You will not miss any intelligence. On the contrary, you will be a much more intelligent child if you have the time for learning how to move in the nature and how to move in the room, how to come into contact, visual contact with interactive uh, smiling. This is something for me, the most important part is interactive smiling, sensitive mother attachment. And this is only, and can only be trained without the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, there is no question about Istanbul Convention, but uh, uh, in any case, I would like uh, to make a comment on it. Yes. Uh, the, the background for withdrawal uh, of our Turkish government was the vast majority of the legal regulations introduced as innovations in the Istanbul Convention are available in our uh, Turkish uh, civil code, uh, Turkish uh, penal code, in our constitution and uh, the related laws. But uh, it is not the end and the debate uh, on this subject is continuing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I've read it a week ago that uh, the Istanbul law court will uh, go into action once again after uh, uh, the withdrawal last year, because uh, we think uh, it is only a good support for the medical, medical community to have this convention, which is worldwide accepted. And we at our round table in Berlin at the health authorities have taken the 2013 uh, uh, translation of this Istanbul convention. I can show it to you. This is the base of our work uh, we always uh, rely on it and we say, this is the base we start from. And uh, we will not uh, go behind this recommendation, but we try to improve it. And there are already handbooks nowadays uh, that go into more details. And the idea is not to uh, put this subject into different 
laws and different uh, systems, but to make it a concise and continuous process. And therefore, this convention is very helpful in my point of view. Thank you. My sister, dear sister Seval, uh, is uh, listening to uh, us and uh, uh, sends her greetings. Thank to, you. Uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, Hakan Bey, can I have the uh, last slides, please? Uh, we, uh, I would like to, uh, to read a poem to you at the end of our webinar. This poem uh, is from a Turkish poet, Aytul Aka, and it refers to child rights. It's a very short poem. Tell the adults. I translate it, if you would, uh, if you like. Tell the adults, the rights are mine, but alas, not to me. Rather, the adults should be told. They should know, they must understand, they should practice. I should only live my childhood. Next slide, please. Yes. Now, uh, we are closing our webinar. We thank very much to Matthias Brockstedt once again, and we thank very much to Berlin Chamber of Physicians, Askame Berlin. And we would like to see you again, not virtually uh, in Izmir. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for your attendance and particip participation. Have Thank a nice day. Have, Have a nice, nice day. day. <laughs> Thank you. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Greetings to Dagmar. Yeah, Thank you very much. <laughs>